Hello, my name's Liz Stamps. I'm Vice Chair and Membership Secretary of the Mary Webb Society, which was founded in 1972 with the aim of furthering the appreciation of her work and of the Shropshire landscape from which she drew her inspiration. So Mary Webb is best known as the Shropshire novelist and poet, but she was also a keen folklorist. As Dr Gladys Mary Coles, president of the Mary Webb Society, has shown in her two biographies, Mary Webb was a collector of Shropshire folklore, myths, legends and superstitions all her life. And this was a fascination that began in childhood and later she wove Shropshire folklore into her novels with great skill. And Mary was intrigued by the work of Charlotte Byrne. And Shropshire folklore, published in 1883, was the first major collection of the folklore of an English county. And she acknowledges the author in the foreword to Precious Vein for the rhymes of Green Gravel and verification of other customs. Now this isn't really the place for a talk about the life of Mary Webb, but I would just like to highly recommend The Flower of Light. This is an in-depth biography of Mary by leading expert, Dr. Gladys Mary Coles. So just to set the scene, I'd like to give you a snapshot of the early life of Mary Webb in order to appreciate how her love of nature and local folklore developed. So Mary Gladys Meredith was born in 1881 in Leyden, near the Reekin, and she spent her childhood years in Much Wenlock. And she had a close relationship with her beloved father, George Edward Meredith, and he had a profound influence on her. He was a classics teacher, an Oxford MA, he loved the countryside, and in their walks together, he introduced the young Mary to her Shropshire world. Flora, fauna, myths and legends, which were to feature in her writing. From her early days, Mary developed an intense affinity with nature and a love of her native county. She also loved to visit the local people, listening intently to their stories and hearing about local legends. And she stored this information to appear later in her work. As she says in the foreword to Precious Bane, Shropshire is a county where the dignity and beauty of ancient things lingers long. And I have been fortunate enough to be brought up in its magical atmosphere and in having many friends in farm and cottage who by a pleasant talk and reminiscence have fired the imagination. But also having the companionship of such a mind as was my father's, a mind stored with old tales and legends that did not come from books. And rich with an abiding love for the beauty of forest and harvest field. So we start to get a picture of someone who was keenly observing, gathering information, totally absorbed in the natural world. She started writing at an early age, initially nature essays, which were later published as the spring of joy and poetry, mainly with nature themes. Sadly, she suffered from ill health from about the age of 20 when she developed the debilitating thyroid illness, Graves' disease, resulting in periods of illness and convalescence. Her writing and her connection with nature provided some solace during these dark periods. Her first novel, The Golden Arrow, published in 1916, is set in the contrasting landscapes of the Long Mind and the Stiper Stones, which she renames Wilderhope and Diaphal Mountain. And she often changed place names to reflect their atmosphere. In the novel, she uses the legend of the Devil's Chair with this evocative and powerful description. 
It's raining over the devil's chair now, said Deborah. On the highest point of the bare opposite ridge, now curtained in driving storm cloud, towered in gigantic aloofness, a mass of quartzite, blackened and hardened by uncountable ages. In the plain, this pile of rock and the rise above it would have constituted a hill in itself. The scattered rocks, the ragged holly breaks on the lower slopes were like small carved lions beside the black marble steps of a stupendous throne. Nothing ever altered its look. Dawn quickened over it in pearl and emerald. Summer sent the armies of heather to its very foot. Snow rested there as doves nest in cliffs. It remained inviolable, taciturn, evil. It glowered darkly on the dawn. It came through the snow like jagged bones through flesh. Before its hardness, even the venturesome cranberries were discouraged. For miles around, in the plains, the valleys, the mountain dwellings, it was feared. So the throne stood, black, massive, untenanted, yet with a well-worn air. It had the look of a chair from which the occupant has just risen, to which he will shortly return. It was understood that only when vacant could the throne be seen. Whenever rain or driving sleet or mist made a grey shakina there, people said, there's harm brewing, he's in his chair. What a description. The brooding presence of the devil's chair plays its part in the narrative almost as another character. Also in the novel, Mary Webb wove in her own interpretation of the local legend of the Golden Arrow, where lovers would go in search of the arrow on Ponsford Hill on Palm Sunday. The finder supposedly won great fortune. Her second novel, Gone to Earth, published in 1917, is equally steeped in folklore. The heroine, the childlike half-gypsy girl, Hazel Woodus, is guided throughout her life by superstition and legend. She lives in fear of the Black Huntsman and the Death Pack. She's reminiscent of tales of Wild Edric. Hazel refers to her gypsy mother's book of spells to help her make important life decisions. But sadly, her fateful decision-making, influenced by these beliefs, ultimately leads to tragedy. So Kath Edwards has already done a fantastic job in presenting her three videos on elements of folklore in perhaps Mary Webb's most famous novel, Precious Bane, in which we heard about sin eating telling the bees and the song Green Gravel. I'd like to add another important element in Precious Bane, namely the heroine Prusson's hair lip. This was seen as a curse, the devil's mark, associated with witchcraft. Prue's mother laments, how could I have helped it when the hair crossed my path while she was pregnant? Prue's facial deformity plays a major role in the development of the plot. So Mary Webb justly deserves her place as a folklorist of Shropshire. From her own experience, she realised the major part played by these customs and superstitions in the everyday life of country folk. There's no doubt that folklore was integral to her novels. As an example, there are 30 legends and superstitions featured in The Golden Arrow and almost 200 in Precious Bane. So please, read or reread the work of Mary Webb for the sheer beauty of her poetic language and her love of Shropshire and its rich history. Her compassion for nature is even more relevant today than it was 100 years ago. I think something that lockdown has taught us 
that nature has the power to comfort and restore the spirit. So, put on your walking boots, explore Shropshire, and walk in the footsteps of Mary Webb. And then if you find yourself smitten, then please join the society where you'll find a very friendly welcome when we're able to get back to our activities. Also, please check out our website, marywebsociety.co.uk and our Facebook page. And many thanks to folk for involving the society in the Kindful Cafe project. And we look forward to more collaborations in the future. Thanks for listening.